Children are naturally very curious. This is an important aspect because it helps them to develop their cognitive skills. They're like little scientists exploring their world. And as they do explore the world and as they do have more experiences, they start to make sense of the world through the development of what we call schemes. You can also call these like concepts. These are just basic understandings of the world, you know, uh, mental structures that help to organize information and regulate their behavior. And children are constantly refining these schemes and adapting these schemes to new information and experiences that they have as they grow older. Schemes can change pretty dramatically over the first few years of life as they learn to make sense of the world. And the way they build their schemes is through two basic processes that occur simultaneously. There's assimilation, where they try to fit new experiences into existing schemes. You can see an example of this right here. So let's say that the child has experienced all these shapes before, and they come to the conclusion that they all belong to the same category of shapes. Then they experience this. Well, if, if they assimilate that shape, if they decide that shape belongs in this shape scheme, then they are building it larger. That, that's how assimilation works. You're just building your schemes larger and more comprehensive. And in order to do this, as I've already mentioned, the child has to be curious. They have to explore. They have to have experiences and learn from them. So that's assimilation. But what's also happening while they're building these schemes larger is they're also modifying them through accommodation. So let's consider the same scheme of shape that we had before. And then the child encounters a new kind of thing that seems similar but not the same. Well, what the child might do in this case is accommodate for this new kind of information by creating different kinds of schemes, different like hierarchy of schemes. So in this case, there is a greater scheme called shape and then a smaller scheme called two-dimensional shape and that's how these things all relate to each other. So a combination helps to deal with these entirely new kinds of experiences, dealing with completely new data. And children will do this throughout their early life, and this will continue well until adulthood. People are never really done developing these schemes. We're always taking the new information we have and trying to fit them in to these structures we've developed. <clears throat> now, a lot of researchers have talked about these different periods of cognitive development where children are building these kinds of ideas. Uh, one of the most famous people, of course, would be Piaget, Jean Piaget. And he, if you remember, broke down the, the cognitive developmental period into four. So first you have the sensory motor period, that's the first two years of life. Then the pre-operational period, that's typically thought of as between the ages of two to seven. Then there's the concrete operational period, which is basically seven to 11 years of age. And then the formal operational period, which is basically everything that after that. <clears throat> now, when it comes to sensory motor thinking, there are some interesting things that we tend to see children do during this point. Like their behavior is very deliberate. It's very means end. They're obviously trying to accomplish something. They're not very good at it yet, and that's kind of the point. They're they're developing their skills. That's that's why we call it the sensory motor stage, because they're developing those motor skills. It isn't until about eight months of age that the child has developed sufficient cognitive skill and motor control to accomplish these simple goals they've set out for themselves. They also Another really interesting aspect of sensory motor thinking is the child tends to lack what we call object permanence. And that just means they do not yet understand that objects will exist even if they cannot see them. They do not understand that objects exist independently of themselves. So a way you can see if a child does not have object permanence is to just 
and you only really see this with very young kids, is to hide something from them. Hide something that they're interested. You know, like take their favorite blankie, take some food, whatever, and just put it out of their sight. If they seem to instantly stop caring about it, then they don't think it exists, most likely. They don't understand object permanence yet. But if they continue to try to get it, if they continue to show distress, now that their favorite thing is missing, then that means they still understand it exists. Even if they can't see it, they understand it exists. Like, just because daddy walks out of the room, that doesn't mean daddy has vanished from existence. You know, it can be pretty pretty traumatizing to some little kids to just have their parents constantly vanishing from existence and then popping back again. But they grow out of it. <clears throat> At about, you know, 18 months of age. This is also where they start to learn some basic symbols. And you can actually teach your child certain symbols during this early stage. Like, it's quite common for parents to teach their child various signs. Even if the parents don't teach sign language, they'll teach their child various signs to just try to un communicate with that child in an effective way as possible. Like, if you do use sign language, then you can teach your child a whole number of different signs. Like, I, I think this is more, and I think this is eat. I, I don't use sign language, but you can teach a child, and it can be an effective way to talk to them long before they develop the linguistic capability of speaking. Now, there's a lot that goes on during the sensory motor stage. We don't need to break it down month by month, but the vast majority of what's happening here is all you know, just making sense of the world and learning how to interact with it. As I already mentioned, not much linguistic development happens here. It's all like under the hood, so to say. It's hard to see exactly what's going on in their head, but keep in mind that a lot is happening. <clears throat> the next stage is the pre-operational stage, and there's some interesting aspects to this form of thought. Uh, the child tends to be very egocentric, and that just means they have a lot of difficulty understanding other people's perspectives and other people's feelings and desires. <clears throat> In many cases, they simply can't do it. It's just not possible. They haven't developed those skills yet. And the result is that the child might come off as kind of a jerk. You know, the child might seem like they're being mean or selfish. But what you need to remember about these children between the ages of about two to seven is that's normal. It's normal for them to not care about other people. They need to learn how to care. They need to be taught that, you know, other person's perspective for them to develop that skill. Another hallmark of the pre-operational stage of thought is animism. It's quite common for these children to give inanimate objects lifelike qualities, such as feelings or needs. Just think of like the movie Toy Story, for example. Like if you ever imagine that your toys are alive and they have needs and they have desires and they talk and do other kinds of human things, that's exactly what animism is all about. And this is normal for little kids to think this way. Like they'll talk about their blankie as being lonely. They'll talk about their stuffed animal as being tired or hungry. And that's just, that's, uh, that's a typical uh, part of this stage. <clears throat> Another aspect of pre-operational thinking is called centration. And that just refers to an overly narrow focus uh, when on their thoughts. Like they're not really understanding the big picture. They're, they're focusing too heavily on the details. Concentrating on only one facet of a problem and neglecting the rest. So it isn't until they get a little bit older that they start to be able to better understand the big picture whenever it comes to any particular issue they're dealing with. So these different hallmarks of pre-operational stage of thinking, they usually are pretty easy to see, but one of the ones that I think is the most interesting and is the most apparent is their lack of understanding of deception. So what I'm saying here is it takes them a while and it, throughout this pre-operational stage, it takes them a while to really understand that reality can be deceiving, that people can lie to you. 
<clears throat> so for example, a child who's about three or four years of age, if they see a person wearing a Mickey Mouse costume, they would just naturally assume that that's a giant person who looks like a rat. Like that is who they are. That's them. It's, they don't understand the concept of like a costume or a disguise just yet. This belief that appearance is reality is, as I already mentioned, one of, one of the more interesting like hallmarks of pre-operational stage of thinking. They just don't understand uh, deception yet. <clears throat> the third stage is the concrete operational stage, and there's some interesting characteristics that occur during this point. Like the child starts to be able to better use logic and inductive reasoning. They can extrapolate general principles from experiences that they've had. They have been overcome that centration, like they can understand the big picture much better. And they're able to understand and use concepts like time and space and volume, but in very simple and concrete manner. When I say concrete, what I mean is if they haven't experienced it, if they don't like have an image or a thought that they've personally developed for it, it's just it's too hard for them to wrap their head around. So abstract concepts or things that they've never personally experienced, those tend to be difficult for them to understand. And then you have the formal operational stage, and that's where those abstract uh, ideas and those things that don't hap have never happened to you become more easy to understand. This is also when the individual can use deductive reasoning, where they can start to try to predict the future. So they can uh, use general principles they've developed to try to understand what the consequences of their actions will be. And they, as I mentioned, they can also think about those more abstract ideas, those ideas that don't have any like physical form or shape, like things that have never happened to them and may never happen to anyone, are they're just better able to understand to a, a degree. So this is the basic idea of Piaget's theory, these four stages and the different thing skills that develop over time. And if you want to test to see if your child is developing along this pattern, what you basically should do is you should give them a challenge that is just a little bit above their capability. Piaget's ideas have been expanded upon by researchers studying chi children's naive beliefs, children's naive theories about life and reality. And what we've basically learned is that kids seem to come into this world prepared to understand certain kinds of things. This is what we call the core knowledge hypothesis. And there's different aspects to this. So infants, for example, they seem to be born with rudimentary knowledge of the world, which can be elaborated on with regard to things like physics, morality, and biology, just to name a few. So when it comes to naive physics, infants, very, very young infants, infants that haven't had pretty much any experiences with the natural world yet, they already seem to understand that objects are solid and cannot move through each other. They also understand that objects must move continuously. In other words, they don't just teleport from one place to another. They also understand that one object must contact another to initiate any movement. And they also seem to show an understanding of the difference between solids and liquids. So those are just a few of those basic like naive physics understandings that we see in infancy. But there's something else that we see in infancy that I haven't mentioned yet, and that's a basic understanding of morality. We've done a number of studies uh, recently showing that infants seem to show an appreciation for moral behavior. And this is really surprising. It's really interesting because throughout the history of philosophy, it's been a common argument that children are born with like a blank slate. Like children are inherently amoral and they need to learn how to be good. They need to learn what it means to be a good person. But this research just completely contradicts that and says, no, 
children are born inherently good. They want to be helpful. They appreciate people who are helpful. Pro-social behavior seems to be instinctively, you know, appealing to these infants. Children also seem to have kind of a naive biology understanding. Like they understand that animals can move by themselves. They understand living things will grow larger over time. And that living things have internal parts which function. Uh, that living things will inherit their parents' traits. That some illnesses are temporary and are the result of contagion or poison. And that living things can heal from damage. But then there's a few other naive theories that children seem to have based on the research we've done that I think are also very interesting. Like a fundamental part of children's theory of life and living things is teleology, teleological explanations. What that means is children just seem to naturally believe that things that exist in the world exist for a reason. Like they were put there to serve a purpose. Like if you were to ask a child, why do lions exist when you take them to the zoo? They'd probably tell you lions exist so we can see them at the zoo. You know, it's fun to look at lions. That's why we have lions in this world. Obviously, that's not why we have lions in this world, but they're just trying to find a reason for everything. <clears throat> Another fundamental aspect of these uh, young children's naive theory of life is what we call essentialism. So children just naturally assume that if something is alive, then it has something inside it, something that drives it, like an inner force, an essence. You could call it like a spirit or a soul. But this, this is just this belief that all living things have something that's intangible, but gives them their identity and gives them their, you know, force. That gives them their emotions and memories and beliefs and behavior, it all comes back to that inner essence. <clears throat>